seeing as how Thanksgiving, the holiday which happens to fall on my birthday this year, is just around the bend, I thought that we could expose one of the greatest cover-ups in Native American history. Of all the legends surrounding early colonial America, there is none more famous than the romantic saga of John Smith's salvation at the hands of the native princess Pocahontas, followed by her marriage to John Rolfe. This love story, which we have been led to believe is entirely historical, has long been lauded for its themes of tolerance, racial harmony, and whatever other garbage Disney uses to impregnate your children with demons. Regardless, is there more to this story than meets the eye? The answer is yes. In fact, Pocahontas is a fabrication, and John Smith was a fraud. When you finally understand the extent of the cover-up, you will be left with the realization that Hollywood and Walt Disney World are nothing more than vicious propaganda machines cloaked underneath a thin veneer of entertainment. While this may not come as news to most of you, I will here be able to detail the precise tactics with which our world history is rewritten. For what we are dealing with in the case of Pocahontas is not just a lie, but a plagiarism, flagrantly plagiarized from Florida. That's right. Not only was John Smith, the man who authored himself to stardom, a complete fraud, but the entire story was hijacked from the native people of Tampa Bay, Florida, an area whose rich history I happen to be quite familiar with. In this video, we will fully expose the Pocahontas story for the fraud that it is, and in doing so, introduce you to the one and only true Pocahontas, Princess Eulalie of Tampa Bay, Florida. The views expressed in this video do not necessarily reflect my own. Now enjoy. Welcome to Florida Baby. Introducing Dr. Narco Longo. Yo, Aunt. Yo. Who's the most famous Native American? Most famous Native American, Pocahontas. Who's the most famous Native American woman? Pocahontas. Are you giving me options or I'm supposed to tell you? Yeah, just off the top of your head. Uh, Pocahontas. Famous Native American. Geronimo. What about women? Pocahontas. I'd, I'd have to say Geronimo. Okay. Now what about woman? Native American woman? Uh, Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> Uh, of course, the, the most famous is going to be Pocahontas. The first name that came to my mind was Geronimo. Who's the most oh, famous man. Native American woman to you? Pocahontas. Oh, famous Native American woman? Yeah. Like, uh, who's that bitch? Uh, Pocahontas? The following comes to us from M. R. Reese in regards to the historical Pocahontas of Virginia. Quote, Pocahontas is remembered as the Native American Powhatan princess 
who saved the life of Englishman John Smith, married John Rolfe, and fostered peace between English settlers and Native Americans. In 1995, Disney released an artistically beautiful, animated film showing the supposed events that unfolded between John Smith and Pocahontas. Although Disney is known for creating fictional tales, many people believe that Disney's account of the life of Pocahontas was a true reflection of past events. The love between Pocahontas and John Smith, the bravery Pocahontas showed when saving John Smith's life, and the tragic ending when John Smith returned to England for medical treatment. However, this depiction is a far departure from the actual events that occurred, and from the real life of Pocahontas. It is believed that Pocahontas was born around 1595 to a Powhatan chief. Her given name at birth was Matoaka, although she was sometimes called Amunute. Pocahontas was actually a derogatory nickname, meaning spoiled child or Naughty one. Pocahontas's tribe was a part of a group of about 30 Algonquin-speaking tribes located in Tidewater, Virginia. During Pocahontas's childhood, the English had arrived in the New World, and clashes between the colonists and Native Americans were commonplace. In 1607, John Smith, Admiral of New England, and an English soldier and explorer, arrived in Virginia by ship, with a group of about a hundred other settlers. One day, while exploring the Chickahominy River, John Smith was captured by one of Powhatan's hunting parties. He was brought to Powhatan's home at Wirowokomoko. The accounts of what happened next vary from source to source. In John Smith's original writing, he told of having a large feast, after which he sat and spoke with Chief Powhatan. In a letter written to Queen Anne, John Smith told the story of Pocahontas throwing herself across his body to protect him from execution at the hands of Powhatan. It is believed that John Smith was a pretentious man, who told this lie to gain notoriety. In the Disney version, Pocahontas is depicted as a young woman when she saved John Smith, but by his accounts, she was only a ten-year-old child when these events occurred, and therefore highly unlikely that there was any romance between them. Pocahontas often visited the settlement at Jamestown, to help the settlers during times when food was in short supply. On the 13th of April, 1613, during one of these visits, Samuel Argall captured Pocahontas to ransom her for some English prisoners held by her father. She was held hostage at Jamestown for over a year. During her captivity, tobacco planter John Rolfe took a special interest in the attractive young prisoner, and he eventually conditioned her release upon her agreeing to marry him. Pocahontas was baptized as Rebecca, and in 1614, she was married to John Rolfe, the first recorded marriage between a European and a Native American. If we pause here, the bit about the marriage being the first between a European and native, that is not actually true, but we will cover that in a little bit. We resume. Two years later, John Rolfe took Pocahontas to England to use her in a propaganda campaign to support the colony of Virginia, propping her up as the symbol of hope for peace and good relations between the English and the Native Americans. Rebecca was seen as an example of a civilized savage, and Rolf was praised for his accomplishment in bringing Christianity to the heathen tribes. While in England, 
Pocahontas ran into John Smith. She refused to speak with him, turning her head and fleeing from his presence. A far cry from the undying love between the two, as portrayed in the Disney movie. In 1617, the Rolfe family boarded a ship to return to Virginia. However, Pocahontas would not complete this journey home. She became gravely ill. Theories range from smallpox, pneumonia, or tuberculosis, to her having been poisoned. And she was taken off the ship at Gravesend, where she died on March 21, 1617, the spring equinox, interestingly enough. It is believed she was 21 years old when she died. Sadly, there were no fairy tale endings for Pocahontas. End quote. Now that we have detailed the life of the historical Pocahontas to the best of our abilities, let us now familiarize ourselves with the Floridian fable with which she has been conflated. The following comes to us from F. P. Fleming. Quote, the story of Juan Ortiz and Ulele. Every schoolchild who has been taught the elements of American history is familiar with the story of Pocahontas, who saved the life of Captain John Smith, married the Englishman John Rolfe, and became the progenitor of various prominent Virginia families, who proudly traced their ancestry to the Indian princess. Yet comparatively few, even among the educated of our country, have any knowledge of the story of Juan Ortiz, the young Spaniard, or the Indian princess Ulele, who saved his life in Florida, 79 years before the events in Virginia which made Pocahontas famous. Juan Ortiz was a native of Seville, Spain, of noble family, and a follower of Pamfilo de Narvaez, who, in 1528, with a force of 600, invaded and attempted the conquest of Florida, but whose great expedition came to grief, the commander in all but four falling victims of starvation, disease, shipwreck, or the vengeance of the natives, who had been cruelly treated by the arrogant and proud Spanish cavalier. Landing first at or near the Bay of Espirito Santo, now Tampa Bay, Narvaez sent back to Havana one of his brigantines and twenty men, among whom was Juan Ortiz, with dispatches for his wife. After executing the commission, the vessel with Ortiz and others returned to the bay. Those aboard were informed by the Indians that Narvaez had marched into the interior of the country. They claimed to have a letter from Narvaez, which they wanted to deliver, and requested the Spaniards to come ashore and receive it. Being suspicious of bad faith, this request was refused, and the Indians were, in turn, requested to bring the letter to the vessel. This they declined to do, but sent four of their number to the vessel to be held as hostages for their good faith. Juan Ortiz and three others thereupon got into a canoe and went ashore. As soon as they landed, the Indian hostages jumped overboard and swam ashore, and Ortiz and his companions were at once seized and made prisoners. The brig thereupon sailed away leaving the prisoners to their fate. Narvaez, who had made a treaty of peace with Yusita, cacique of the province called Hirihiqua, afterward treated that chief with the greatest cruelty, giving his aged mother to be torn to pieces by dogs for complaining of an outrage which had been committed by one of the Spaniards on the person of a young Indian woman. The chief, becoming incensed, threatened vengeance when he was seized and scourged 
by order of Narvaez, and his nose cut off. This chief and his family were not slow to wreak their vengeance upon the unfortunate Spaniards who had now fallen into their hands. They were taken to a square, enclosed with palisades, and, in the presence of Yusita, one of the four was stripped of his clothing and made to run around the enclosure, while the Indians amused themselves shooting arrows into his body, until death terminated the cruel sport. This was repeated with the two others, until Ortiz was the only survivor. Believing him to be the son of Narvaez, he was reserved for slow and more lingering torture. A wooden frame was constructed on which the victim was laid and bound, and a slow fire built beneath. The tortures of the unfortunate youth, who was but eighteen years of age, excited the pity of an Indian woman, who hastened to the dwelling of the cacique, and made known the situation to Yuleli, the chief's eldest daughter, then about sixteen years old. The young princess thereupon threw herself at the feet of her father, and entreated him to suspend the execution and release the victim. Her request was granted, and Ortiz was unbound, but suffered greatly from his burns. He was attended by the medicine man of the tribe, and the princess and her attendants did all that they could to relieve his sufferings. But, notwithstanding the importunities of his daughter, Usita would not desist from the infliction of continued cruelties upon the young man, or relieve him from the sentence of death under which he was. He was employed in the most slavish and laborious occupations, and at times compelled to run all day in the public square, where Indians stood ready to shoot him if he should stop. After about nine months of such life, the chief consented to suspend execution of the death sentence for a year, on condition that he be required to keep guard over the cemetery of the tribe. Three miles from the village, where, according to custom, the bodies of their dead were exposed on biers or stages several feet above the ground. It was necessary to keep watch over them at night to protect them from beasts of prey. Criminals under sentence of death were usually appointed to keep this watch and were permitted to live provided they escaped from the dangers of their occupation. If the guard permitted a corpse to be carried away, by wild animals. He was put to death the following day. Yuleli informed Ortiz of the conditions of the suspension of his sentence, which he did not hesitate to accept. Armed with a bow and arrows, he commenced his lonely watch, occupying a hut in the midst of the cemetery. The stench of dead bodies soon overpowered him. From this he recovered, however, sufficient to drive off wolves that appeared in the early part of the night. About midnight, an animal carried off the corpse of a child. Ortiz, terror-stricken at what might result from the failure of his vigilance, followed in the direction that the animal had taken, and guided by the sound of the gnawing of bones, taking aim as best he could in the dark shot an arrow at it, which he was rejoiced to discover next morning, had penetrated the heart of the animal, a panther, and killed it. This feat won the admiration of the Indians. After about two weeks of such service in the cemetery, the Princess Yuleli, accompanied by two faithful attendants, came to the cemetery one night and informed Ortiz that the priests had demanded his death at their approaching festival, that their demands would have to be complied with unless he escaped by flight. Inspired by the great beauty of the Indian princess and her uniform kindness to him, Ortiz made a declaration of his love, 
entreated her to accompany him in flight, seek asylum with some friendly tribe, and become his wife, promising to take her to the land of his birth. But the dusky maiden was not slow to inform her white suitor that her kindness to him was not the inspiration of love, but pity for his sad condition, that she was already betrothed to a neighboring cacique, Mokoso, to whose protection she was about to recommend him. She then presented him with a girdle, as a token that she had sent him, and furnished him with a faithful guide. Accompanied by this guide, Ortiz was prompt to seek safety in flight, arriving near Mokoso's village. The guide then left him. Some fishermen discovered him as he was approaching the village, and took up their weapons with the purpose of assailing him, but desisted when he showed them the girdle. He was then led by them through the village and to the presence of the chief Mokoso, a young Indian of handsome appearance and intelligent countenance, to whom he presented the girdle sent by his betrothed, the Princess Eulalie, with request for his protection. Mokoso assured him of safe asylum, and treated him with every kindness and exception. When the cacique Yusita heard that Ortiz had escaped, and taken refuge with Mokoso, he sent a demand to the latter for his return to him. This Mokoso refused, causing an estrangement between the two caciques, which delayed for a considerable time the marriage of Mokoso and Eulalie. Such marriage took place, however, at the end of about three years. Upon learning of the landing of Hernando de Soto in 1539, Mocoso sent Juan Ortiz to him with an escort of about ten Indians, and a message asking friendship on the grounds of his protection and kindness to Ortiz. In the meantime, de Soto had dispatched Balthazar de Gallegos with a force to find and bring Ortiz to him. This force, coming upon Ortiz and party, without knowing who they were, proceeded to attack them, causing the Indians to flee for safety. But Ortiz, whose dress and appearance was so like an Indian as to deceive the Spaniards, remained, avoiding the thrusts of a lance directed at him, made the sign of the cross, crying out, Sevilla, Sevilla, then informed his countrymen who he was. Most of the Indians who had accompanied Ortiz were now induced to return. Ortiz was taken to De Soto, and Mocoso's message delivered. Ortiz then told his story. De Soto thereupon sent messages to Mocoso, urging him to visit the Spanish camp. In ten days, the cacique arrived accompanied by his warriors. De Soto received him with great courtesy and assured him that his people would ever be grateful to him for his kindness to Ortiz. To this Mocoso replied, What I have done for Ortiz is but little indeed. He came commended to me and threw himself upon my protection. There is a law of our tribe which forbids our betraying a fugitive who asks an asylum. But his own virtue and dauntless courage entitles him to all the respect which was shown him. That I have pleased your people, I rejoice exceedingly, and by devoting myself henceforth to their service, I hope to merit their esteem. This speech much touched De Soto, and his officers, who treated Mocoso with every kindness during his stay of eight days. These friendly relations were continued without interruption. Juan Ortiz was furnished with proper clothing, armor, and a horse, 
and attached himself to De Soto's expedition, in which he rendered invaluable service as a guide and interpreter. He was not destined, however, to return to his native land. Following the fortunes of De Soto for nearly three years, he died during the winter of 1541-42, to west of the Mississippi, where the expedition spent the winter. His death preceded that of his great commander by only a few months. Irving says of him, his death was a severe loss to the service, as he had throughout the expedition served as the main organ of communication between the Spaniards and the natives. End quote. There is an overwhelming likelihood that John Smith used published accounts of Ortiz's experience to create his Pocahontas story. It was not until after Pocahontas died in England in 1617 that the Pocahontas story showed up in a revised account of Smith's adventures, and no other colonist of the time makes reference to it. Quote, It's something nobody can prove one way or the other, said a Florida historian, William Coker. But on the other hand, the evidence, I think, leans pretty heavily in favor of Smith borrowing the story, end quote. The following was printed in the New York Times in 1995 upon the release of Disney's Pocahontas. Quote, A survivor of the DeSoto expedition, known as the Gentleman of Elvas, included the Ortiz rescue in his account published in Lisbon in 1557. An English translation was printed around 1605. A Spanish account by Garcilaso de la Vega appeared in 1601. Quote, Lisbon and London were on good terms, Professor Coker said. There's no question in my mind that copies of the book in Portuguese, Spanish, and English were in London early on and early enough for John Smith to have made a thorough study of them, end quote. There is ample evidence to show that John Smith's story of being saved from death at the hands of Powhatan by his daughter Pocahontas was inspired by the story of Juan Ortiz being saved by the daughter of Chief Uzita. John Smith was even in the precise time and place to have heard the Juan Ortiz story. Smith's earliest text is a True Relation of Virginia, submitted for publication in 1608, the year after his experiences in Jamestown. The second was The General History of Virginia, which was published in 1624. The Pocahontas episode is subject to the most scrutiny by critics, for it is missing from A True Relation, but it does appear in the General History. Richard Hackluet's translation into English of A Narrative of the Expedition of Ferdinand de Soto into Florida was published in London in 1609, years before John Smith published his account of being saved by Pocahontas. Additionally, the publication of letters, journals, and pamphlets from Jamestown colonists, was regulated by the companies that sponsored the voyage, in that the communications must go, quote, directly to the company, because no one was to, quote, write any letter of anything that may discourage others, end quote. This would mean that Smith violated this regulation by first publishing a true relation as an unknown author. Leo LeMay theorizes that the editor of the general history might have cut out references to the Indians' hostility, bickering among the leaders of Virginia Company, and the early supposed mutiny of Smith 
on the voyage to Virginia. For this reason and others, it has even been argued by some that John Smith never even traveled to the colonies. In fact, he may have never even existed, as John Smith is actually the equivalent of the name Juan Ortiz, both in simplicity and popularity. Is it any coincidence that John Smith has come to be the English name most associated with mystery, espionage, anonymity, and the manufacturing of identities? Smith is also widely believed to have embellished his prior military service. One tale which he would tell about himself was when he beheaded three Turkish soldiers in a single skirmish an unlikely feat for the age of gunpowder, even by the strongest of swordsmen. Regardless of John Smith's validity, there are a number of additional factors which point to a Floridian origin for the Pocahontas myth. The first of these factors is that the Pocahontas saga took place when Jamestown was allegedly still a peninsula. Today, there is no such Jamestown Peninsula, for we are told that erosion has since transformed it into Jamestown Island. When we compare this to the story of Juan Ortiz and Princess Eulalie, which also took place on a distinct peninsula, we may note that this peninsula, known as the Pinellas Peninsula, is still there today, for it is permanent. The second factor is that the marriage between Pocahontas and John Rolfe is given as the first ever wedding held between a European man and a native woman. This is provably untrue, as the actual first instance of an interracial marriage took place in Florida during the previous century. The following comes to us from Stephen Edward Riley, quote, The marriage in 1566 of Pedro Menendez de Aviles, the Adelantado of Florida, and an Indian princess known to the Spaniards as Doña Antonia, the sister of the Calusa Indian chief, Carlos, also known as Carlos. The wedding took place on what is now known as Mound Key, on the southwest coast of Florida, and was quite an intercultural event, including both Calusa and Spanish foods, choruses of Calusa maidens, and a performance by a dancing dwarf. It did not, however, produce a child, as did that of Pocahontas and John Rolfe. The significance of this union which Carlos forced upon an unwilling Menendez, lies in what it reveals about the Calusa and their world. Carlos's sister was accustomed to being married to cement friendships. This was her third such marriage. End quote. Just as Pocahontas would sail with her husband back to Spain, Doña Antonia, too, accompanied her husband back to Spanish territory, albeit the island of Cuba. The third factor is that of tobacco. As if the Pocahontas story were not incredible enough, we are also expected to believe that Pocahontas' husband, Jean Rolfe, is the man credited with the modern cultivation of Virginia tobacco. However, the native people of Tampa Bay, Florida, to whom Princess Eulalie belonged, are likely the oldest users of tobacco in the United States, and they had encountered the Spanish on peaceful terms decades prior. Their name, Tocobaga, is potentially the origin for the word tobacco itself. In the first half of this tribe's name, we find the common American word toke, 
which means to take a drag from a cigarette or joint. In the name of their homeland, Tampa, we find the word tamp, meaning to pack a pipe. Tokabaga is translated in the native tongue as meaning place of the gourds, a possible reference to the crafting of tobacco pipes, for which the Florida natives are also remembered. Now that we have exposed the plagiarism, we must also answer the question of, why would they lie? It has long been the hobby of mainstream historians to undermine Florida's designation as the starting point of the United States as we know it. Florida was a Spanish colony. Virginia was an English colony. England wished for the Western world to consider America as British. Thus, there could be no room for romantic tales of Spanish glory. The English were decades behind the Spanish in their efforts to colonize America, and this sort of literary warfare was not an uncommon tactic used to undermine the achievements of colonial adversaries. Additionally, there is the factor of the politicization of skin color. While race is rarely the focus of my videos, it is worth addressing the impressions left on the American public by Disney's Pocahontas in regards to the racial makeup of Native America. Disney's Pocahontas is a decidedly Asiatic woman displaying traditionally mongoloid features. This includes monolid eyes, pin-straight black hair, a square jaw, and a height lesser than that of the average European explorer, a depiction which differs from the modern East Asian only in that the American often features an aquiline nose, a trait linked with both Roman and Jewish ancestry. You will note that this depiction has come to be the uniform depiction of American Indians in pop culture, regardless of the fact that ancient America was home to many races with various complexions and differing skeletal structures. Our mainstream historians have foolishly assumed that since the red man, or rather yellow man, is the most present and favored by our mainstream media, that he must be the original. This is simply not true. There is in fact ample evidence, both anecdotal and archaeological, to support the presence of at least four anatomically distinct races of men in America prior to the recent advent of the European. There is evidence of the Bering Strait Mongoloid, as we have discussed, but there is also that of the prehistoric mound builders, who antedated the Yellow Man by thousands of years. This race of men is by far the largest of stature, often displaying cranial morphology 
and bizarre arrangements of teeth. The skin color of this race is difficult to ascertain, as their remains are the most deeply deposited and perhaps the oldest in the Americas. Then there is also that of a Negroid race prior to the advent of the enslaved African, meaning that the black man was established in the Americas long before Columbus. The same Spanish de Soto expedition from which the original Pocahontas story comes to us also makes clear mention of pitch black, dark skinned natives living along the American Gulf Coast. And lastly, there is that of the ancient Hyperborean, a race of men displaying the skeletal structure of modern-day Northern Europeans, meaning that their skin was white and their homeland the Arctic. This race, too, was present in the Americas, before the yellow or red man, for his DNA has been preserved in the swamps of Florida, proving both his European origin and his great antiquity. These truths are incompatible with the politically motivated, out of Africa, and bearing straight theories, upon which our modern academic paradigm is based. And for that reason, they have few champions. In a single swoop, Hollywood was able to quell any debate as to the true racial identity of Native Americans, and dethrone Florida as the birthplace of the United States. As if being written out of history and having her heroic deeds attributed to another were not bad enough, efforts to commemorate Eulalie in Tampa Bay have been met with stiff resistance from the city and even the mayor himself. The following comes to us from Damon Scott at the Seminole Tribune. Quote, the 11-foot bust of a Native American princess was removed from the Tampa Riverwalk in Tampa Bay on September 18, 2018, causing a bit of controversy. The massive 1,800-pound statue named Eulalie and the Lost Tribes had been on display for about a year, adjacent to the Eulalie restaurant, located at 1810 North Highland Avenue. The location of the statue was what the city of Tampa took issue with before ordering the removal. Tampa Mayor Bob Buckhorn wanted the bronze sculpture gone because it sat on city property, not the property of Eulalie restaurant owner Richard Gonsmart. Quote, Richard was told not to put it there, said Ashley Bowman, director of marketing and communications for the city. He was asked to put it on his property. The Eulalie and Lost Tribes bust, located near the Eulalie restaurant on Tampa's Riverwalk, was recently removed. Bowman said the removal had nothing to do with what the statue represented. Eulalie comes from Native American legend and was intended to celebrate. Eulalie comes from Native American legend and was intended to celebrate Native American culture. The Eulalie restaurant is also named for the princess, who is believed to have lived in Florida in the 1500s. It had instantly become a popular spot for Riverwalk visitors to take a photo. Quote, but it was essentially an advertisement for his property, Bowman said. Gonsmart is a huge community player, but we just can't treat him any differently. Bowman said the city has a rigorous process for the approval of public art. Quote, we have historic busts all the way down the Riverwalk, and one that pays homage 
to our early Indian settlers, she said. The process for approval goes through a vetting by historians. Gones Mar owns the Columbia Restaurant Group, which operates a slew of eateries across Florida. He's a fourth-generation operator of the original Columbia 1905 restaurant in Tampa's historic Ybor City, a fixture for tourists and residents. Quote, While we initially were disappointed that we had to move the bust that I had commissioned as a gift to the community, we feel confident that the Lost Tribes eventually will return to public display on a site that the city will like, Gonsmart said in a statement to the Seminole Tribune. The statue now sits in a warehouse in an undisclosed location due to insurance and security considerations, Gunsmart said. The work was commissioned by Gunsmart for sculptor Vala Ola of Cave Creek, Arizona. She and others were critical of the city's decision and said it's a slap in the face of Gunsmar and Native Americans. Quote, You lately walked along the rivers and shores of Tampa Bay, and she belongs there, Ola told the Seminole Tribune. Ola said the bronze monument represents all the Native American tribes lost to the past. Their rich history and tradition adds a beautiful layer to this land. The land Eulalie's monument was placed on was the land of her tribe, she said. In addition to the bust, Ola created a statue of the princess walking through fire for Gunsmar. That statue is currently located on Gunsmar's property at Eulalie. When the bust was publicly dedicated last year, members of the Seminole tribe of Florida, including medicine man, Bobby Henry, were in attendance, end quote. Minutes ago, we watched work crews remove this huge bronze bust of Princess Eulalie from Tampa's Riverwalk, and that is causing some controversy this morning. Well, the big bronze bust is of Princess Eulalie. It's been in Tampa Heights since December. ABC Action News reporter Adam Weiner watched it all happen. He's live there now for us. And Adam, the city says the statue had to come down. Why'd they say that? Well, they said that they wanted the river view free of clutter, even if it's art. And so goodbye public art. The statue was sitting here uh, outside of the Eulalie restaurant, right outside of the Tampa Armature Works building uh, since, as you mentioned, since December. But the crews just removed it. And I believe we've got some video to show you of that process just a moment ago. Uh, it took a crane. They lifted it up, they strapped it up nicely, and they dropped it on a flatbed truck and they took it away. Uh, the reason that they did this, uh, the reason that the city got their way, uh, is that the land sits on own that is technically owned by the city. Uh, so, of course, the city said it wanted, they wanted it to go, and so there it went. Uh, it's about an 1,800-pound statue. It's 11 feet tall. Uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't the smoothest process sometimes. It takes a, a lot of heavy equipment, of course, uh, but they were able to move it pretty quickly. Uh, the state and the restaurant, sorry, the statue and the restaurant uh, named for that Eulalie princess, a Native American princess believed to have lived in Florida hundreds of years ago. Uh, Richard Gonsmart, the owner of the Columbia Restaurant Group, personally had this statue created because uh, he loved the story of the Eulalie princess, loved the art, and wanted to share it with the Tampa community. He says it is the mayor himself, Tampa Mayor Bob Buckhorn, who did not like the statue, he says, and wanted it gone, and now it is gone. Now, where is it going from here? We're told he's going to be moving it to a storage facility, a warehouse somewhere for now until Richard Gonsmart decides where he wants to move it next. So goodbye, Princess Eulalie. For now, live here in Tampa, Adam Weiner, ABC Action News. Tonight, it was a landmark that honored an era of history and inspired the name of a popular Tampa restaurant. And then the city forced the owners to move it. Well, tonight, a new chapter in this story. Here's Wendy Lane.
And I want this story to be shared with children about the people that called this home. It's a story that Richard Gonsmar is so passionate about that he had this statue created. The 11 foot, 1800 pound bronze sculpture commemorates Princess Eulalie, who is said to have courageously saved a young Spanish sailor from being burned in the 1500s. She will be here and we will tell stories of the compassion of that princess. But not even a year after the statue went up, it came down. In December of 2018, the restaurant moved the statue to a warehouse after the city claimed it didn't have the proper permits to be on city property. But after getting proper permitting, finally the statue was reinstalled. I'm here to try to preserve history, respect history, respect those that sometimes weren't respected. Being honored like this puts us in the history books because a lot of our students still recognize us as uh, gone. There's no more Native Americans. But today, you know, we still exist. The reinstatement of the statue is in co-celebration of the reopening of the Ulele restaurant, which has been closed since March because of the COVID-19 pandemic. That spirit lives on tomorrow and today. We are capturing back our freedom to be able to celebrate all that life offers with friends and family. In Tampa, Wendy Lane, ABC Action News. Before closing, I would like to address the fact that Eulalie's statue was titled Eulalie and the Lost Tribes, as in Lost Tribes of Israel. This is either a conscious or unconscious tip of the hat as to the hidden Hebrew genealogy and practices of certain Native Americans. We will now conclude with Pocahontas by William Makepeace Thackeray. Wearied arm and broken sword, wage in vain and desperate fight. Round him press a countless horde, he is but a single knight. Hark! A cry of triumph shrill, through the wilderness resounds, as with twenty bleeding wounds sinks the warrior, fighting still. Now they heap the fatal pyre, and the torch of death they light. Ah, tis hard to die of fire. Who will shield the captive knight? Round the stake with fiendish cry, wheel and dance the savage crowd, cold the victim's mind and proud, and his breast is bared to die. Who will shield the fearless heart? Who will avert the murderous blade? From the throng, with sudden start, see there springs an Indian maid. Quick she stands before the knight, loose the chain, unbind the ring. I am the daughter of the king, and I claim the Indian right. Dauntlessly aside she flings, Lifted axe and thirsty knife, fondly to his heart she clings, and her bosom guards his life in the woods of Powhatan, still told by Indian fires, how the daughter of their sires saved the captive Englishman. <laughs>